it's I have it just sitting there for the last twenty minutes. Anybody have a song they want to start with today? Thirty-two. You just rattled that number off. Thirty had picked that. Start off the day with a little Cat Stevens. <laughs> this part for those who are able to read this right so the final thoughts 
for week one talked about how we live our lives lost and, and how we, we struggle through and we try to find meaning in life. And, and, and they, they brought up a bunch of really extreme examples, and I'm not going to say it doesn't happen, um, but of things that people will fall into, sins that people will fall into, because you try to find some sort of sense of meaning and some sort of sense of happiness and joy in the world around us, and we get sucked into things that just are not of the Lord and are not good, right? I mean, we've all been there. And, and, and sometimes I struggle when they give the extreme examples because I feel like it sort of whitewashes or marginalizes the just average things that people don't see as bad, but they still pull us away from God. And there are things that we still try to do to find happiness and to find joy. But there are things that aren't really bad, they're not sinful, um, but they're still a distraction. And that's really what I want to say. You know, there's things that we just do in our lives that distract us from God. And, and that sort of tries to give us this sense of meaning. So there are two things that we wanted to get through in this first part. Now, if you're reading the book, when you, when you get your inductive, you don't have this book yet, um, when you get it, it's even more overwhelming initially than this little book is. <laughs> But once you start to get into it, it's like, oh, it, it breaks it down really nice and it's really interesting because a lot of what's being said in here is actually also said in here. I'm going to back up for just a second because I want to share my one personal aspect of getting into this. And, and hopefully, it'll, for those of you who feel overwhelmed or, you know, like, I don't know if I can do this, when I first started reading this and all the instructions, and then I got this, which also has a bunch of instructions, like do this. When we went through this, right, we have a whole message online about get the right pencils and the dry markers that don't bleed through on your Bible. And, you know, and, and, and you've got to mark this and mark this and do the pronouns. And then, you know, I'm like, pronouns? I, I can't remember what a pronoun is. Now I've got to do English lessons to do my Bible study. And I first sat down to do this, and I felt overwhelmed and an incredible sense of anxiety as if I was back in college again. Like, I gotta do this right because I gotta make sure I get the right answers. That's, that's what hit me. I gotta make sure I'm getting the right answers. And then I realized there, there is no wrong answer as long as you're doing this diligently. Let me be careful about saying that. There's no wrong answer as long as you're doing this diligently. One thing that's going to come out the same for all of us, and so I will share this one part, because in the first part of this, in John 1, verses 1 through 18, what they're trying to get us to see is that Jesus is part of the Trinity. I mean, it explains the Trinity, and that the Trinity is the one thing that can never be explained. But that Jesus is God, Jesus was with God, God sent Jesus, Jesus is the Word, God was the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And so the whole idea is that we understand that Jesus came, was sent from God. And, and we understand and we, we at least try to somehow, if not embrace try to dissect and try to absorb this overwhelming thought that a man came to earth, but he wasn't a man. He was the son of man. He was God. That is the foundation we talked about in one of the previous messages. That's the foundation that starts all of it. That's why when they first start this, they tell you to go to, to John 20, verse 30 and 31, I do believe, right? That's, here's... Here's the meaning of the book. Here's the meaning of the first part of John. Right? This, this is the, the Gospel of John. This is the overarching message. Here's why he wrote it. Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. But then when it goes back, it says, if you read your first week, it says, just embrace these two verses. John 1:1. 1, 1. Anybody want to read it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and 
the Word was God. And the second verse they want you to embrace is John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and the glory is the, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Everybody catch that word begotten in there? Okay. Anybody want to throw out a verse that uses the word begotten? Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Good job. Well, that's something. Yeah, what verse is it? It's in John, right? Yeah. We'll get to it here in a little bit. 3.16. John 3.16, right? right? The begotten son. Right. That was a guess. It wasn't a guess. You knew it. I knew it. That was a guess. That was just a wild guess that I actually knew this verse verbatim. Um, so, the first part of this, as you're going through, if I'm going to share this, because this is not the personal, this is the corporate part that we should all be on the same page, no pun intended. Jesus is the Son of God. He came for our salvation. That's the foundation that you're going to get out of it. And... I'm going to ask, for those of you who were, who were able to, to do some of this, I'm going to ask for a little bit of conversation on this in just a second. But here's the second part. And we go back to this where it talks about, I was just talking about how you try to find this purpose in your life. You try to find the, some sense of meaning, right? That's always a big question. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Um, I know a few years ago I did a... I did a long paper on a, a philosopher, I won't get into the details of it, who asked that question, like why, and basically it was, why do, why do we bother? Why do we bother trying? Like what's the purpose of us even being here? And, and it was pretty interesting to look at it from a philosophical standpoint. It, and I want you guys to promise me, when I share my personal reflections, my personal insights, I want you guys to understand, these are my personal, and this is where God is leading me in life. This is not me saying, well, here's the answer, now do it this way. All right? Because I, I could show you a lot of scripture, I could start rattling off, right? God calls some to be preachers, some to be teachers, some to, right? We're all called to something a little bit different. And the idea of doing this study, the way we're doing it, is that we're all going to find and embrace that purpose that pushes us away from the world and those things that distract us from a deeper relationship from God. And we're going to find a joy in the things that we are doing. And I can share example after example after example of people who do this. Here is the one thing that has embraced me over probably about the last decade to the point that it actually annoys Kathy. There's many, many quotes out there about planting a tree. Anybody ever heard a quote about planting a tree? There's many of them out there, and, and basically they all go to some aspect of the man who plants the tree but knows he will never enjoy its shade has started to understand the meaning of life. All right? And that is my own personal aspect to the point that it is almost annoying at times. That whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm led to do, whatever I'm supposed to be doing, isn't really so much for me in the here and now, but what am I doing for the next generation? What am I doing for those who come after me? What life am I leaving so that the next person has it maybe a little easier or a little better or a little bit more enjoyment, but hopefully also to know God? And I've gotten to this point where when we are doing, I'll give just a couple examples, and I'm not saying I'm really perfect at it, or I'm really good at it, I mean, I certainly am, I'm, I'm selfish at times, we all are, but um, you, you all know we're doing this big renovation on the house, right? So my plan is to actually redo all of the plumbing in the, I'm gonna strip all of the plumbing out of the house as we go along, and all of the electric, and then when I redo it, I don't want the next person to have to go through what I did you all know, you ever been in an old house, right? You're like, wait, what does this switch? Wait, how does this switch tie into, well, I've told stories about us. So I want to have everything labeled and laminated and ready so that if anything happens to me, she'll be okay. But then the people who are after us, when we're gone, they'd be able to go down to the basement and go, oh, there's the main shutoff. There's this, there's this, there's this. 
and their life is okay. It's going to be a little more at work and effort for me, and I won't really get the enjoyment of it because I already know where all the switches will be. Right? I've gotten in an absolute argument, flat out open argument, where people had to leave the room with somebody with one of the other organizations that I'm involved in because I argued with him that we should be worried about the next generation and quit worrying about what benefit we're getting out of that organization. It's not for us at this point. It's for them, and we need to bring them up. This is where it really annoys Kathy. I'm to the point where I will start to decide whether or not I'm going to make a driving decision based on who's behind me. I'm going down Market Street. I need to get over into the left lane because I need to make a turn because I'm going to Lowe's. But, you know, I'm doing 39 miles an hour and I see this car coming. Maybe I should just slow down and let them... I don't want to get over and get them. What if they're going? Kathy's like, oh my gosh, just drive. Will you just drive like you're in North Carolina? That's what she used to tell me. Just go. They're behind you. They'll do what, just stop worrying about them. I'm like, but I don't want to mess them up. That's a really bad habit. What? You're not alone. <laughs> I'm not alone. You do that too? I'm glad. I'm glad other people are like, other people look at me like, oh, I get it. I know what you're saying. John's the one behind you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's the aspect of where God has been leading me. And so when, when I'm doing this study, I'm getting more revelations of not only where, where do I lay into that idea of what am I teaching the next generation? What am I leaving for the next generation? But also, where do I have to have my own personal growth? Where do I have to have my own? Because at times I should still have joy out of it. And I've already had some revelations. I'm not going to share some of the revelations, but I've had a couple of revelations out of that already. Um, so when you guys are doing this, this study understand that there are going to be very individualized things that God is going to be speaking to you. There are going to be some verses that some people, the verse will have like no major impact whatsoever. There will be some verses where you'll read and go, yeah, I get it, I understand. And then there will be verses where you're going to read that verse and it's just going to hit you and you're going to be like, wait a minute, I don't get it. I don't know what he's saying right here. You might go back through and read that verse again. Be like, I'm just stuck. That's where we need to be together. But I don't want to be, and I told Kathy this, I said, I was going to ask this question today. And it's interesting because I already know she has a verse. Although she hasn't told me what it is yet. And now I'm praying that she's not going to leave me hanging, but I don't want to share. Um, but I am not going to stand here and act like I have the answer. Because the answer would be what God does. Yeah, the book is the answer, right? Um, but in the interpretation and revelation of it, I don't want to say, oh, this is what God... Because if I do that, then I'd be like, well, this is what God spoke to me. This is how God revealed it to me. And, and this is sometimes misleading. And this is when, I mean, if we're honest, this is where a lot of people sit in churches and just get sort of complacent. Because they're like, oh, that's what the pastor told us. We're good. And this isn't what this study is. What is God telling you? Not what am I telling you? So I'm going to ask a question. And, and I pray we won't go too long on this. Who has a verse? Everybody head in the boot room just turned. You already set her up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so chapter 1, verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. And then my asterisk went on chapter, verse 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. And then 12. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So it's sort of mind-boggling came to his own. Okay, now I feel really bad because I just stood here and said, I'm not going to tell you the answer because no, no, I, mean, I, 
I, I don't want to. However, this is um, this is a classic section of the Gospel of John where he ties into the other Gospels, but he doesn't share the whole story because he doesn't feel he needs to. The other three Gospels, we've got to remember this when we're reading the Gospel of John, the other three Gospels have been out there for a couple decades by the time the Gospel of John is written. The Gospel of John is written to answer specific questions. So he summarizes certain things. And then some things he just leaves out. You all notice we don't start out with the Christmas story, right? We don't start out with his birth. We get right to the heart of the ministry because that's the question that was pro brought to um, the Apostle John. So in this part, read the first part again. Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Okay, stop. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Read the rest of the 10. The Maybe okay. And the world did not know him, right? So he was in the world. The world did not know him because... This is where it goes back to, that first part of it is tying back to John 1.1. 1, 1. He was, right, because he is the Son of God, but nobody knew that he was the Son of God. They, they called him all sorts of different things. I mean, good things, right? They all thought he was a prophet. Um, they thought he was going to be a, a political leader. Um, they did not know that he was actually the Messiah. All right, and we could, we could share that in stories. He's summarizing, right? Because there's a point, we look at the other Gospels, right? there's a point where he's like, he asks his disciples, like, who do you say I am? And, and so that's the summarized part. So now read verse 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Okay, so that goes back to the other Gospel stories where he goes back into Nazareth, right? And his own, when they say his own people, it's his neighbor's. Is the people that knew him growing up, the people that knew he was the carpenter, um, would not receive him as the Messiah. They wouldn't even receive him as a prophet. Um, they would not listen to him, right? There, there's that story where he's out speaking, and somebody goes, wait a minute, isn't that like the son of Joseph? Like, what, what's he think he's doing? And so for him to actually get the message out, he had to get away from the people who knew who he used to be. Hold on to that for just a second. He had to get away from the people who knew what he used to be if he was going to actually share the message. I want you to think about that for a second in your own life. How many times are you with people who you see regularly, who know you from, right? Because I still have people in my life that when they see me, they still see me as the Keith I used to be. Right? And that's how they interact with me. That's how they try to talk to me. That's how they try. Those are the stories they try to bring up. And I had to get to a point that I have to separate from those relationships and, and make a clear distinction that I am not that person anymore. And there are people from my past that I still see, like I have family members that I still see now. That now there is a clear distinction. If I'm still having a relationship with that, God didn't cut off everybody in my life. Um, but there are people that were family members that I have that, you know, when they start to have a conversation, I'll, I'll stop it and be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna come I'm not gonna talk about that. We're not gonna go there. All right? Think about that in your own life. How many times do you, you know, how many times do you get in the conversation just hanging out with family, hanging out with friends? And people, when you start having those interactions, people are seeing you as who you used to be just because that's how they know you. It's not saying you're doing anything bad or doing anything wrong or you're sinning. It's just that's how they know you. And so that's how they perceive you. And you have to. You have to. If you're growing in Christ and you really want to share that truth, you have to draw a line and make that distinction. Make sure people see that distinction in your life. Jesus had to do that. All right? Fine. I'm going to get away from these people and we're going to move to here. And I'm going to share the truth. Because, let me finish this and go a little bit deeper theologically with it. He's the Son of Man, right? He is God. He could have easily have just poof and got the truth into their heads and into their hearts. But as soon as he does that, what's absent? What's missing? As soon as he does that, somebody. Free will. Free will. So for there to be free will of people to accept Jesus Christ, then they have to actually receive him in and of themselves, not have it forced upon them. Because there's nothing to say, and there's nothing in the Gospels that says it at some point. Well, actually there is. Let me share one story really quick. I'm not going to read directly from Scripture, but 
At one point, I know it's in the book of Mark, um, I think it's in Mark 5, don't hold me to that, that Jesus is preaching, right, and so they go and get his family, and they're like trying, the family's trying to get Jesus to just come away, and they're like, Jesus, your mom's out here, can you just, and he goes, who is my family? You know, you who receive, right? You are my family. You are my brothers, my sisters. You are my mother. You are my... But his mom, his birth mom is standing out there. Hey, Mary's out there. And he's like, eh, no. So we can say that she's one who did not know him and did not receive him. However, we know, and we're going to see it in the Gospel of John, right? Who's at the cross? His mom. So there's nothing saying that at some point they didn't receive the truth, but they have to receive it in and of themselves. We can't force it upon them. Let's go to verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Okay, that's pretty... You got that part? Those who receive Jesus Christ, for whoever shall believe, right? Romans 10, 13. For everyone who believes shall be saved. And that's just that finishes it up right there. For those who would believe have inherited the kingdom of God. That, that's it's a, it's a summary of the first two verses. So so now I apologize for being a hypocrite because I just said on camera if you bring a verse up to me I'm not going to sit here and act like I know the answer but that was a really fun one to break down because that was a theological breakdown. Anybody else having a hang up or a hiccup so far? Really praying for one or two because I'm like, this could be a good message for next week. That could have been a good message for next week, but it was just too fun to do it right now. Just one of my notes it goes right along with those same verses. The Jews, it's a note. This is me thinking, right? Feel free to share. The Jews sent the priests and the Levites to question John. They tried to trick him into comparing himself with God. They didn't know. They didn't know Jesus. You know, it was, they were trying to trick John into comparing himself with God. But John said, "I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, telling the truth of the Lord." You know, that goes right along with those. Are, you know, they didn't know him, but God gave us Get, power. I want to hold you on that for just a second, because. You, of anybody in the church, is the one person that says we have to know the Old Testament. Yep. Right? And you just read that read that line again right now. Nope. Read, read that. What, read what he just said. I am one. Oh. Where are we? I am one of. I, I, I am like the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And where does that come from? Just Moses. Oh. Isaiah. Isaiah. That is Isaiah. That is Old Testament right there. Right. Um, so, and that is the perfect union that we will see through all of this. Yeah. I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt you on that, but I was like, no, well, that's no, perfect. Because, yeah, this, right? that is a perfect, we talked about how we have to know the Old and the New Testament to really have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. That is one of the first in the Gospel of John episodes of the Old Testament coming directly in when John the Baptist um, basically quotes Isaiah. So, on, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I saw no, that all no, it was just a note, and, you know, I was just... You know, she read those three verses, and I'm thinking, well, over here, I got a note that coincides right along with that. Yeah. You know, they didn't know. They didn't know. You know. And even when they heard it over and over again, they didn't want to believe. And that was coming from the priests, the high priests and the Levites. You know, they, they, so anything else on the first part of it? No. Okay, who feels uncomfortable right now because you feel like you're in class and you're like, I didn't do my homework? Please don't. Don't, don't, don't. As we do this, just roll along with it. So um, I have done my homework, but just reading. So the Wait, what did you do in your homework? I <laughs> said so I didn't do it. You didn't do your homework? No, I did. Okay. You're out of town. We'll stand in the corner. Does that mean the Jesus beginning of the world? 
Yes, so again, let's tie it back to the Old Testament. Now we're going all the way back to Genesis, right? If we go back to Genesis, man, I wish I knew my verses better. Um, like, I wish I had them memorized. I know the verse, I just don't know which verse it actually is. But in Genesis, God is speaking and God speaks in the plural. He says, let us make him in our ear. Who's us? That's the question. Who is us? If we go back to Genesis, let me open up my Bible real quick. This is where the Trinity ties together. It looks like it starts on 26, 126. And God said, let us make man in our image. Yes. In our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea. And blah, 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 blah. So you notice that God is speaking in a plural. That God is with the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is the beginning of the Trinity. And so yes, Jesus was with God in the beginning. That's marking that red. <laughs> What's that? I'm marking us red. Because oh. <laughs> I never got that. Yeah, that was a good one. I like this. So, is it, yeah, but bummer, man, the first two. I'm like, I know the I already know the answer. I studied this. <laughs> like, I want something I have to go back and study. Anything else? Just open up to a verse. Just open up to me. I don't understand a verse. <laughs> Exodus 15, 22. Just wrap it off. So, okay, so here's my question. I, there is no, right, this is just a study. This is us just working together, sharing biblical knowledge and biblical insights as we each get them. Um, and I want you to feel comfortable to say, hey, I got something really cool. During my studies this week, can I share just for a minute? He just did, right? I want you to feel comfortable to do that because in doing that, you are helping somebody else. Right? You have no idea sometimes what you share that somebody sitting there quietly is like, oh, I needed to hear that. Um, and, and we certainly we can't be much more of an intimate group to be able to do that than we are right now. Um, so you should feel comfortable to, to go ahead and share. So in the coming weeks, I want you to, to, to feel comfortable doing that. I'm not going to stand up here and finish with a, my usual big, here's my takeaway, therefore go. We should just know to therefore go, right? Um, it's just we are doing a church Bible study for us and for them online. And I'm hoping that people online will send me emails or messages on Facebook going, hey, i got a question, because um, you've done it before. And here's my question to you now. There is a lot to get out of this first week of the study. Um, do you want me to give a little bit more of an insight to the first chapter of John? Or are we okay going to the next week study for next week? And for those of you who haven't done it yet, um, the, this week's study, remember, remember I said this seemed overwhelming, like when I set, first sat down, I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta do all of this, okay? Part of these things that they ask you to do in each day, it takes like five minutes. Like the one that said, highlight the word God, or highlight the word work, highlight the word word, word. word. Um, <laughs> right? It, it, it's only the first 14 verses. It, it took me two minutes. I was like, oh, I did today's study. I'm like, Probably keep going. Um, some of them get a little bit more detailed. And so if you want to stay on it for this week, um, and we'll do week one over again, which I'm really cool with, here's what I'm going to ask. Is there is a couple days in there where it asks you to go back and talk about your insights. It asks you to write down a couple things. It talks about the John the Baptist. Like, what did you get at? What the insights did you get about John the Baptist? That's sort of what he was sharing right there. And to write those down. I can't remember which days it is. I think it's like Wednesday and Friday, but I can't remember. Um, but that's where I'm going to focus then. And I'm going to ask you to be willing to share just a little bit. 
Um, and that's what we'll do for next week. So we'll stay on the first week of the study, and we're going to do this, like I said, we'll do this all the way up until we get into the Advent season, and then we'll just make sure we do our, we'll go back to baby Jesus. So that was from Talladega Nights. I always hate that. I like baby Jesus. So anything else for today? This is awkward as all get out for me because this is not my usual ending to a message. It's just a study. But I really think it's important. The study, I, I bounce around. I'll go back and try to see what was going on before the verses that they mm-hmm. used. You know, uh, Luke 24, or yeah, 20, 23, 24. It's God talking. It's a good way I, I kind of got how to go about to study it. I said, and he took it, wait a minute, and he said unto them, these are the words for which I spake unto you. I use a King James Version. What verse are you at? 44. Okay, sorry. While I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You know, that's our Bible study. You mm-hmm. know. And said unto them, This is written, and thus it be- behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And yea, are witnesses of these things. Now, he's talking to us, too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, generations later, he's talking to us. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with a power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now, is that the way I should go about this Bible study? Is just what he was saying right there. You know, right the last few verses before we got into John. Well, okay, so let me let me get slightly theological again. Um, so, and I don't have the, the King James. Um, no, but well, I, mean, I love that we use different this. versions. There are so many different versions of the Bible in this church right now. Yeah. Um, so... Okay, so in verse 49, Luke 24, 49 says, And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And we all know that to mean? Educated. No. That is going, the prophecy of going into Acts. Um, and it, that is the coming of Pentecost. That is the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And we get to Acts 1.8. Right? Um, for everyone who receives shall be my witness. Therefore, go. I can't remember how verse 1 8 goes. I used to know it, have it memorized. Um, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Um, he told them to stay in the upper room. So when we go, we get to the historical understanding the who, what, when, where, and why of how we do this Bible study. That is talking about the book of Acts. He tells them to go in the upper room, and they're all gathered there, and they're waiting. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are all baptized by fire. They all start speaking in tongues, um, which means, in context, I just feel like I have to explain this when I say that, because the whole speaking in tongues thing gets so convoluted at times. It is, it is the Passover. It is the, the everybody, all of the different people are in Jerusalem, so there's many different languages being spoken. And they come out, and they can speak every single language, and they are sharing the testimony and the truth of Jesus Christ to everybody in their language. And that's when they say, oh, they're drunk. And, and that's when Peter stands up, and we go to Acts 2, and Peter gives the sermon of all sermons talking about the truth of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want to share about this, if you're going to do that in that aspect, because I agree with you, yes, do it in this aspect, but understand, he says, don't do anything until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Which means, if you're going to do it in this aspect, be led by the Holy Spirit in all you do in these studies. Which sounds simple enough. But we all know millions of people who pick up the Bible 
and they pick one or two verses to fit how they're living their lives, right? And go, this is the truth. And they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. If you are being led by the Holy Spirit as you do this, you are going to have some serious revelations in your life that will lead you on a path of a deeper relationship and a life and a service of Jesus Christ. That's what he was telling. Yeah, well, it, so. you know, just kind of my interpret. That's how I should go into this study, is educate. Don't do it. Do it with the right thought. Yeah. The right mindset. Yeah. yeah. All right. Perfect time, place to end that. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Now may the peace, the love, the joy, and the grace of Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. Keep you safe, keep you strong, and in His service, and to life's blessings.